This country's in trouble. The only hope for America is God. So we're holding a prayer march, praying for our nation. Let's call upon the name of God and let's pray out loud together. We ask for a revival for our country. We repent for our sin. We repent for the sins of our forefathers, God. We're going to recognize ethnicity and all the beauty that you gave us, Lord. Let God rise! The Spirit of the Lord God is here in this place. We have three generations bringing God and prayer back to the United States. Because we are here today, God is going to change this nation. Amen. Hear all the prayers that have been prayed on the mall today. May we not fail on our watch. Thank you all for coming. Life is full of decisions. Some don't seem like a big deal, but a choice you make, just one decision, can change your life forever. You can make one choice, and it can affect you throughout your whole life. I felt like I didn't want to be on this earth anymore. I said, are you crazy? And I started thinking, and I really made the right decision. Unfortunately, many of the decisions that you make in life can never be reversed. If you had only known what was around that corner, you might have made a better decision. No matter what your decisions are, all decisions have consequences. Thank you for coming out today. We're here today because our nation is in trouble. We're in trouble spiritually, racially, economically, politically. And there's no political party that's going to turn this thing around, okay? The only hope for this country is Almighty God. We have decisions coming up for this critical election. But there's a decision that all of us have to make that's even more important. Today, you can make a decision. As a kid, I don't remember ever being told there was a decision to be made. I spent six years hiking 48 mountains and people say I'm a pretty determined guy. I pick up my grandson, Cody, and we hike rain or shine. It's definitely a bonding thing. Ready? Come, Papa. Years back, when I was at night school, we had classes in theology and philosophy and existentialism. During that time, I started really asking, well, is there a God and who is he? The answer I eventually came up with was that there wasn't any God. And, and I remember it the day that I said it, I was standing in my office and I said, there is no God. And it just, something came right out of my chest like that. And I, I just ignored it. And I said to myself, I'm just gonna keep on going. talking 
about important decisions today. I saw that he was coming to Tallahassee. Oh, I was, I was excited for that. When I started cooking for the kids, it was just, for, for me, it was exciting to serve them. Their face lights up. They'll run to me, good morning, Miss Lourdes. Oh, I love it. I love my job. The teachers here, they make me feel I'm part of the family. We laugh, we goof. But there was a problem. There was something inside of me that no one knew about. My first thought is, what are they gonna think of you? 40 years that I hold on to this secret, that I didn't tell anybody what I have done. I made that decision to bury that secret inside of me. I heard of the decision of America Tour, but I wasn't able to go, and I started watching it on my phone. I'd describe myself as not the average girl. I'm not the one that likes to get all dressed up with makeup and get my nails done. She appears quiet and, you know, but once she gets to know you, she really opens up and tends to want to help out and get in, involved in, you know, what everybody's doing. She's got a good heart. I like to go out and shoot my guns and be outdoors and do a lot of outdoorsy kind of things. She definitely felt like she didn't fit in. She liked to hang out with the boys and do boy things. A lot of kids make it hard. They like to be mean, they like to pick on you, they like to point out every little flaw that you have. You feel like you have to fit in a lot. When you're going to school and you're being picked on every single day, it made me feel worthless and lowered my self-confidence. God so loved the world. Isn't that wonderful? He so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. And if you had been the only person to ever live, he would have sent his son from heaven to this earth to take your sins, because he is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of forgiveness. He loves you. Wow, when I heard him saying, God is love, God is merciful, that touched my heart. Because no matter what, he knew my secret. He still loves me. He loves me. We all have made bad decisions. I've made plenty of them. In life, we have a problem, and that problem is called sin. Sin is disobedience to God's standards. All of us have failed God's standards. And we see evidence of sin wherever we go. Why do we have military? Because of sin. Why do we have police forces? Because of sin. Why do we have car alarms? Because of sin. We're all guilty of breaking God's law, and there's a penalty for breaking God's law. If you drive too fast, one of America's finest is gonna turn his lights on and pull you over, and you're gonna get a ticket. You could go to jail. But you see, the penalty for breaking God's law is far more severe. The penalty for breaking God's law is death. And the Bible says that we have all sinned, come short of God's glory, and the wages of sin is death. I don't know where to begin when we think of the sins of our country, so many. I think about abortion, same-sex marriage, pride, the worship of money and profit and big business, racism, lack of care for the poor. Our entertainment in this country is about sex and violence. It only takes one sin, only one infraction, of God's law to keep you out of heaven. Only one sin. God is holy, and he has to separate himself from sin, and he separates himself from sinners because we have broken his laws. But let me tell you something. God sent Jesus Christ on a rescue mission, and he came from heaven. He died in your place. Your decision today is between two paths. It's between life and death. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide that leads to destruction, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it.
my supervisor had called me on that Tuesday. And she was like, well, we have an event. I was like, okay. I really wouldn't expect anything out of it. But once um, I got there and he got to talking, it was like, wow. Something came over me. It was like he was talking to me in so many ways. I was clubbing like every weekend, um, gambling. I wasn't going to church that often. I wasn't praying like I used to. I had to make a decision that I had to change my life. You got a choice today. In like sixth grade, the bullying was like very bad and it was just beyond what I could handle. Kids didn't want to hang out with me. They'd call me names and they would tease me a lot. She was just kind of not um, being herself. She was throwing up every day. She just really just kind of shut down and didn't want to go to school, didn't want to see people, didn't want to do anything. We were really concerned of, of Molly and how she was feeling inside. I didn't really tell anybody, but I wasn't sure I wanted to live anymore. I just wanted to leave and just go away. As an atheist, I just felt that Christians were silly people that didn't understand the world. But something happened that had a big impact on my life. My grandmother got brain cancer. I went to her room and told her in her bed that we had to be practical, that she was gonna die, and that was all there was to it, and left her right there. and she died two or three days later. Not, not right away, but over time, I started looking again for God. And I started to think, I fully believe there is a Halley's Comet. I kept wanting to go see it and never did. And I said, if I can believe the newspaper that there's a Halley's Comet, why couldn't I believe the apostles that had lived with Jesus and seen his miracles. I started really asking, well, is there a God and who is he? And how does Jesus figure into this? There's only one way that leads to eternal life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You say, but Franklin, why Jesus? Because Jesus Christ is the only one in history to come from heaven to this earth. And he took our sins, your sins, and he went to the cross. He carried our sins to the cross where he died in our place. We deserve death. He was buried for our sins. But on the third day, God raised his son to life. Jesus Christ is alive. He's not dead, he's alive, and he's right here today. Everyone has a decision to make concerning life and death. Life and death. Life and death. I didn't feel like I should live. I eventually changed schools. I started going to a Christian school there was an announcement to go up to the Decision America tour, so a group of four of us went up. When I saw those people at the rally, I knew it was where I needed to be, and it felt really good. It was interesting at first, like, because he started talking about politics, but then I kind of zoned out, but then he talked about, like, making a decision so you would know where you would go. 
the decision is between two futures. It's either heaven with Almighty God or it's hell separated from God for eternity. And hell is a real place. But remember this, can't remember anything else. Remember this, God loves you. He loves you. But if you reject God's plan of salvation, he has no choice. When you stand before him to be judged by him, he has no choice but to banish your soul to hell for eternity if you reject his salvation. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, then after this the judgment. Oh, you say, but Franklin, God is a God of love. He is. He is. That's why he sent his son Jesus Christ to this earth, because he loves you. Jesus Christ took our sins because he loves you. This is God's great love. But he's offering salvation. He's offering forgiveness. He's offering cleansing. But you've got to be willing to accept it. When I heard those words, I already believed in Jesus. But how he said it, I knew I didn't have to keep hiding. But I have to willingly accept him in my heart. The secret that I was holding, I didn't tell anyone, ever. There was a time that I was depressed and I would sit down on my sofa and I would just cry and cry and cry. When I heard Franklin Graham say that Jesus loved you, it just made me feel I need to repent and follow Christ. The Bible says God demonstrated his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What's your decision? The decision has to be made by you. It can't be made by your mom or dad. It can't be made by your church. It can't be made by your girlfriend or boyfriend, grandmother, grandfather. You have to make this decision. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. Are you lost today? Are you forgiven? You're going to heaven? You say, Franklin, I think so. No, I, I've had people say, Franklin, I hope so. <laughs> I'm not talking about hoping so. Are you sure? Are you sure? I was standing there in the Capitol and this one question stuck out in my head. Are you sure you're saved? And I wasn't. I had to think, years back, we were invited to a Sunday service and I accepted Christ as my savior during that service. But it had been 18 years since we'd been to church and when he asked, are you sure you're saved? I didn't know what to say. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And you see, the decision was urgent. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You see, if you go to the airport, you go to get on a plane and you're sitting there trying to make up your mind. Well, I might get on there. No, I think I might not. If you don't make the decision, a decision is going to be made for you. That plane is going to back away from the gate and it's going to leave you standing there, right? God is offering forgiveness. He's offering salvation but you've got to be willing to accept it. What Franklin said at the rally really gave me hope. I really understood. Jesus has died on the cross so he could take our sins away, and so I decided to pray the prayer along with them. That day, Franklin explained salvation and called on everyone there to pray to have their sins forgiven, and I did. I'm free, free. God poured into my life. My grandson, he'd never been to church before, so we've been going every Sunday. You know, you come to the event for one thing, but you turn out a whole different person. Franklin prayed, and I prayed with him. It just hit me. I needed to repent. I decided that day to live for Christ. I wanted to really commit and change. As Franklin said that prayer, I prayed along with him to repent. I've never heard anyone say it like that before. When I prayed, 
it felt like a cinder block was kicked out from my chest. It felt like I could fly. And I said, amen. God is good. Because he heard my prayers. And he hasn't left me. I didn't want these kids to go through what I went through. This secret that I had, I needed to share it. The next thing I knew, I was standing in front of this church to tell my story. When I was there in front of the youth, my son AJ, boy, I was shaking. I just broke down. I had no words. And in my head, it's like, don't speak, don't say nothing. Go back. You can decide whether you're going to serve self or you can serve the God of heaven. I had to take a breath. That's when I knew that he wasn't leaving me. Jesus, he was there with me. At the age of 14, I found out I was pregnant. I had an abortion. It was a secret because of the shame and the guilt. But God wanted me to come out of it. I stood quiet because I felt terminated. Because I didn't know how people would take it. God worked in me. God forgave me. And he's still working in me. I felt that elephant. It was off my shoulder. I felt that relief. I told them with Jesus, just knowing that he's there and the joy, you don't want to let it go. His love is different. His love, I can't tell you how wonderful it is, how big it is. For the first time, I don't feel scared. I have this peace. It feels good inside. The call is urgent. What do we need to do? We need to repent. Repent of your sin. And by faith, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him as your savior and follow him as Lord. You see, repent means to turn and go the other direction. Are you willing to, to turn and go the other direction? And you say, but Franklin, you don't understand that. I just can't quit. I just can't turn. I can't stop. I can tell you right now, when you invite Christ to come into your heart, the Holy Spirit of God comes in your life. He'll give you the power. He'll give you the strength. Since I've made that decision, I found a church family and a wonderful youth group, and I've decided to get baptized this summer. Baptize me in the heat of the burning sun. She came back a changed individual, and she had a ripple effect on, on us. We've all made the decision as a family to commit to follow Christ and to be baptized. I want to give you an opportunity today to invite Christ into your heart to make the greatest decision of your life. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never invited Him into your heart, if you've never made Him the Lord of your life, today, you can make a decision. We 
all have a decision that we have to make concerning Jesus Christ. You see, there's two roads, a wide road and a narrow road. I was on that wide road for a long time, and maybe that is the road you're on. And you see, the Bible talks about a narrow road that is the only way that leads to eternal life. And my question to you is, what road are you on? You can make the most important decision of your life. You can do that right now. You know, the Bible tells us that God loves us. And right here in John 3, verse 17, it says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. God loves you, and He wants to forgive you. But the only way that can happen is you have to come to Him by faith, believing in His Son, Jesus Christ, who took our sins to the cross and died in our place. And if you'd like to invite Christ to come into your heart, if you'd like to have your sins forgiven, if you'd like to have a new life and a new beginning, you can just pray this prayer with me right now. And this prayer is just simply talking to God. And you can just repeat it after me and God will hear. Let's pray. If you'd like to pray that prayer, do it right now. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he took my sins to the cross, that he died in my place and shed his blood for me. And I believe that you raised him to life on the third day. And I want to invite him to come into my heart right now. And I want to trust him as my savior. And I want to follow him as the Lord of my life forever. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Remember this, God loves you and he's forgiven you. You've got a new life and a new beginning. Trust him and obey him. God bless you. Thank you. America's in trouble. This country used to be a beacon of hope. There's a sense of helplessness because we don't feel like we could change anything. The most important thing that we can do is to pray. The only hope for our nation is Almighty God. At this next election, vote. I believe an individual person can make all the difference. Vote for candidates that stand for biblical principles and are willing to live them. We just need to stand up. Christians need to speak out. We need to get Christians engaged. Go back to your community. Be an advocate for God's truth. It's time for God's people to stand up. Pray for a miracle, then do something. We're not just to take our light and hide it under a bushel. We're to set it up so the whole world to see it.